Welcome everyone. We are going to start a new chapter in this lecture that is chapter number 2, 12th NCRT textbook. It is Sexual Reproduction in Flowering Plants. So, uh, many of the students have asked for one shot lectures so that it will be helpful for them at the round of revision so that they can complete the whole chapter in one lecture. So, that's what I started. So, we'll try to complete this chapter in a stretch. Okay. So, now sexual reproduction in flowering plants. We know in plant kingdom, there is only one group of plants which come under flowering plants. What are they? They are angiosperms. That means in this chapter, in this chapter, we are going to talk about the reproductive process in angiosperms. Angiosperms are the only plants who will flower. Now, when we talk about flower, when we see the group of flowers, married of flowers, we enjoy. When we uh, feel the scent or the perfumes of the flower, we enjoy. When we see the rich colors of the flower, we enjoy. So, don't think that the flowers are meant for us. Flowers, actually the plant is producing flower as an aid of sexual reproduction so all these things bunch of flowers scent perfume rich colors for the flowers what are they all of them are the means or the aids of sexual reproduction so we came to know that flowers are reproductive organs of a plant so what are flowers so flowers are reproductive organ Flower is a reproductive organs of plant. Now then, what are root, stem and leaf? Root, stem, leaf, they come under vegetative parts. Flower come under reproductive part. So, root, stem and leaves. They come under vegetative parts. They are vegetative organs. Flowers are reproductive organs. Root, stem and leaf are vegetative organs. Right. Now, human beings have intimate relationship with the flowers since time immemorial. Like flowers, if you see, they are meant for aesthetic pleasure. They are having ornamental value. We use flowers in social ceremonies, religious ceremonies, in cultural activities. We use flowers. And not only that, we use flowers to convey our symbols, to convey our feelings like love or affection or happiness or sadness like grief mourning and all so we use flowers to convey our symbols also right now if you see they are asking us in NCRT they are asking us list down any five ornamental flowers let us list down so they are asking us a question in NCRT list down any five ornamental flowers which are grown in garden they are asking so if we have to list down any ornamental flowers which grow in the garden means jasmine we can take rose we can take lily we can take hibiscus we can take orchids we can take marigold chrysanthemum these are some examples the examples of five ornamental plants which are grown in garden are so we can list down jasmine then comes rose hibiscus means china rose we can write then lily we can write chrysanthemum we can write and marigold we can write so these are some flowers which are grown in the garden as ornamental values in the same textbook they asked us list five more flowers which are used in social and uh, cultural ceremonies right so they're asking list five more flowers so which are used in social and cultural ceremonies now again for making garlands and all again we use rose we use jasmine we use lily for making bouquets and all we use dahlia so they are the examples what we can write again we can write for making garlands for making bouquets we use jasmine again we use rose again we use lily we use dahlia orchids so these are some plants which are used in social and religious ceremonies right now in ncrt they asked us what is floriculture also so they asked us what is floriculture come on do you know what is floriculture 
Floriculture means it is cultivation of ornamental flowering plants. If we are cultivating plants which are having ornamental value, that science is called as floriculture. Floriculture means it is cultivation of ornamental or we can tell cultivation of flowering plants. This is called as floriculture and have you heard of horticulture? Then how is floriculture different from horticulture? Now horticulture means it refers to cultivation of any type of plants like croton plants need not be a flowering plant. So it can give us fruit also like palms and all, mango and all, crotons and all which indoor plants and all. So they come under horticulture. Only flowering plants come under floriculture. So horticulture refers to cultivation of all types of plants. This is called as horticulture. Understood? Now for a biologist, what is flower? For a biologist, flowers are morphological and embryological marvels and biologist considered, considers flower as a site of sexual reproduction. Biologists consider flower as a site of sexual reproduction. Now, when we have to talk about the sexual reproduction process through flower means sexual reproduction can be differentiated into three stages. The first stage is before fertilization. We call call it as pre-fertilization events. The first one is called as pre-fertilization events. The next one is called as fertilization events. The last one comes under post-fertilization event. Pre-fertilization events, next one is fertilization events and the third one is post-fertilization events. Next one is post fertilization events. Now, for fertilization, gametes should be made and the gametes should be in close proximity to each other. So, that means making gametes is called gametogenesis and gamete transfer means pollination mechanism. So, what comes under pre fertilization events? I told you under pre fertilization, so we are going to talk about gametogenesis means making gametes and we are going to talk about gamete transfer gamete transfer in plants it is pollination how is the pollen grain traveling and reaching the stigma that is pollination now gametogenesis includes making male gamete also making female gamete also male gamete making is called microsporogenesis female gamete making is called megasporogenesis so and under gametogenesis we are going to see micro sporogenesis this is the process where we make pollen grain okay so next one is megasporogenesis megasporogenesis where we are going to make the female gamete egg so the two pre-fertilization events are gametogenesis and gamete transfer fertilization where both of them they fuse result in formation of zygote then post fertilization events how will zygote develop into embryo and who will nourish the embryos endosperm endosperm formation and the embryo development will talk in post fertilization in post fertilization we are going to talk about endosperm development we are going to talk about endosperm development and we are going to talk about embryo development so these are the things which we are going to see in post fertilization under fertilization we will see how is zygote formed in fertilization we will see how is zygote formed understood take a screenshot we will continue right finished now in NCRT they have given the diagram of the flower the parts of the flower now a typical bisexual flower shows four horals it shows four rings the outermost ring is called as calyx the second ring is called as corella the third ring is called as andrisium and the fourth ring is called as gynesium. Now if we see the flower, they have given us the picture of the flower. This is the stalk which is called as 
thalamus on the thalamus if we see on the outermost whorl in the outer ring so sepals will be there right so what are these called as sepals now where are sepals present sepals are present in the outer ring what is the outer ring called as calyx now the second ring is called as corella in corella petals will be there now if we have to see the petals of the flower they are bright attractive parts of the flower so this is petal now petal is present in which whorl petals are present in a whorl called corolla they are present in a whorl called corolla and the third whorl is called andrisium andrisium is a whorl in which the male reproductive organ stamens are there if we have to show stamens right this is one stamen and the other stamen so whole structure is called as stamen right so this is anther the part of stamen and here is the filament anther and filament both of them they make up stamen and what is stamen stamen represents the male reproductive organ of the flower stamen represents the male reproductive organ and the stamens are present in a ring the name of the ring is called andrisium where are stamens present they are present in a ring called andrisium and the innermost whorl is gynesium in which pistil the female reproductive organ will be there if we have to see the pistil this is the stigma long and slender style the bottom part is the ovary stigma style and ovary all three together is called as pistil and what is this complete structure called it is called as pistil and where is it present it's present in the innermost whorl of the flower which is called gynesium this is called gynesium right so in ncert they asked us they are asking us name two important reproductive parts of a flower so name two important reproductive parts of flower what are the two important reproductive whorls if they ask andrisium gynesium a parts if they are asking stamen and pistil so the parts are stamens and pistil now we wrote stamen represents the male reproductive organ whereas the pistil represents the female reproductive organ take a screenshot we will continue yes now when we have to talk about the male reproductive organ male reproductive organ just now we wrote it is stamen now what is stamen what is the other name of stamen children stamen is also called micro sporo fill filla means leaf okay so it is making microspore male spore that is why it is called microsporophyll flower is a condensed shoot stem it is on the stem leaves are there means all sepals petals andrisium gynesium are floral leaves then so that is why the stamen is also called as microsporophyll now the stamen has two parts stamen has two parts so we know the picture of the stamen this is a long slender stalk of the stamen what is it called filament right and at the terminal end of the filament it has bulged bilobed anther so what are the two parts so at it has a slender elongated stalk what is that stalk called filament and at the terminal end of the filament at the terminal end of filament it has anther it has anther now usually the typical anther of angiosperms it is bilobed you can see there there are two lobes so we tell it is bilobed in nature 
now again each lobe contains microsporangiums each lobe contains two microsporangiums one two three four okay so that means each lobe contains two microsporangiums bilobranther will contain four microsporangiums bilobranther contains how many microsporangiums four microsporangiums so bilobed nature is called dithecus condition and four microsporangiums is called as tetrasporangiate dithecus anther will have more four microsporangiums it is called as tetra sporangiate condition this is a common type this is a common type but when you see some families like malvesi where china rose is a member lady's finger there there's only one anther lobe so in malvesi members like hibiscus and lady's finger now in these two plants the anther has only one lobe if it is having one lobe then two microsporangiums will be there one lobe with only two microsporangiums will be there so one lobe condition is called as monothecus and two microsporangiums what is it called as two microsporangiums is called bisporangiate so in hibiscus we call it as monothecus by sporangiate monothecus by sporangiate you find it in hibiscus you find it in lady's finger we find it in malvesi members means here only one anther lobe will be there this anther lobe will have only two microsporangiums this is a condition understood till here now the filament it is the stalk and the anther lobes in anther lobes two microsporangiums will be there now take a screenshot we will discuss about the structure of the microsporangium right so when we have to see the structure of microsporangium now microsporangium is visible how is it visible it is visible clearly in the transfer section when we do the transfer section then we see the microsporangium clearly right so we can tell the ts of the microsporangium if you see one microsporangium it is circular in outline ts of microsporangium how is it it is circular in outline if we see the whole anther it will be like this this is one anther lobe and here is another anther lobe so both the anther lobes are connected this is one anther lobe another anther lobe are connected by a sterile tissue which is called as connective this is parenchymatous tissue which is connecting this lobe to the other lobe now this micro and this anther at the four corners it has microsporangiums so this is one microsporangium second microsporangium so each lobe contains two microsporangiums at this corner also one microsporangium and another microsporangium the whole anther in ts of anther it is the whole anther in transfer section it is tetragonal it is tetragonal and where are the microsporangiums the microsporangiums they are at the corners they are at the corners and when we see the microsporangium how is a microsporangium appearing it's appearing circular in outline it's appearing circular in outline and when we see the walls of the anther so the microsporangium is covered it is covered by four layers it is covered by four layers the outermost layer if we see the microsporangium this is a outermost layer of the mic enlarged view of one microsporangium i am showing you this is the outermost layer this outermost layer is called as epidermis 
the first layer what is it called it is called epidermis single layered epidermis will be there tightly packed cells will be there the function of epidermis is protection and the second layer will be endothelium that is also one layered only but the cells of endothelium are radially arranged the cells of the endothelium are radially arranged on their radial walls they have callous thickenings on the radial walls one layered but it is uh, the cells are radially arranged on the radial walls they have callous thickenings and this endothelium uh, it is hygroscopic in nature means it can absorb water it can lose water so this second layer is called as endothelium endothelium is hygro scopic in nature hygroscopic means it can take water it can lose water okay this is the fun second layer and the third layer is called as middle layer how many middle layers will be there one two five middle layers will be there one layer can be there three layers can be there five layers can be there now if we have to draw the middle layers so one two five layers will be there so we'll make two layers here so these are the middle layers so this is the third layer which is called as middle layer now the function of middle layer is to give support what is the function of middle layer to give support now if you look into the inner layer if you look into the inner layer inner layer is called tapetum the innermost layer of microsporangium it contains densely packed cells which contain dense cytoplasm so these cells what are they called they are called tapetal cells they have prominent nucleus sometimes it can have more than one nuclei also and it has abundant cytoplasm and what are these cells called they are called tapetal cells this is tapetum now these are the four walls i told you outer wall epidermis protection second wall endothelium it is hygroscopic it helps in dehiscence of the anther splitting of the anther when the anther splits then only the pollen grains can come out the third layer middle layers one to five layers will be there they help in providing support to the anther the fourth layer is tapetum the function of tapetum is nourishment the function of tapetum is nourishment now in order to this tapetum what do you find we find a mass of cells if it is an young anther that mass of cell is called sporogenous tissue if it is a matured anther pollen grains will be there if it is an young anther what do we find inside so we find a mass of cells young anther these cells are called as sporogenous tissue it is called as sporogenous tissue sporogenous tissue contains spore mother cells we can also call them as pollen mother cells so all these cells each cell is a potent spore mother cell it can undergo meiotic division the spore mother cell undergoes meiotic division so here is a spore mother cell if it undergoes meiosis it will give one two three four microspores right so this is called as microspore tetrad this is a structure of microsporangium epidermis protection endothelium helps in dehiscence middle layers they give support to the anther the fourth layer tapetum it helps in nourishment so we'll see the functions of tapetum have a screenshot right if we have to list down what are the functions of the tapetum Now the first function of tapetum we told it helps in nourishment of the sporogenous cells food it provides nourishment to sporogenous tissue this is first and foremost function and if we have to talk about the other functions the tapetal cells they secrete ubis bodies or ubis granules they secrete ubis granules these ubis granules only will make sporopollen these ubis granules only will make sporopollen what is sporopollen sporopollen will make the outer layer of the pollen grain sporopollen it makes the outer wall of 
pollen grain that means the outer wall of pollen grain is made by sporopollen and the sporopollen is secreted by the tapetal cells that is a next function then next function if we have to see now i told you that this is one spore mother cell undergoes meiosis division and it make four pollen grains or four pollen grains they, they will be together in ncrt they have given us a picture they are showing this is one pollen grain another pollen grain third pollen grain fourth pollen grain now this arrangement of pollen grains is called as isobilateral arrangement what is this arrangement called iso bilateral arrangement of pollen tetrad it is isobilateral arrangement of pollen tetrad so from one pollen mother cell from one pollen mother cell this is one pollen mother cell from each pollen mother cell we get four pollen grains they will stick together in this manner and this outer wall which is covering all the four pollen grains this wall is called as callose layer and when the callose layer dissolves then only each pollen grain will come out for that we need callase enzyme the tapetal cells will secrete callase enzymes to dissolve this layer and to release the pollen grains out the third function is tapetum tapetum secretes callase enzyme it secretes callase enzyme to dissolve the pollen grains now to dissolve the callose layer and to release the pollen grains next one entomophilus flas if the pollen grains have to stick to the insect body then the pollen grains should be sticky that means a pollen kit should be there for that pollen grains now that sticky nature is secreted by tapetum only so tapetum it makes pollen kit it makes pollen kit it makes the pollen grain sticky so that it can stick to the insect body and it can help in pollination children these are the functions of the tapetal cells take a screenshot we'll continue now we were talking about pre fertilization events in that we told microsporogenesis microsporogenesis means formation of microspores from microspore mother cell just now we saw microsporangium we saw microsporangium microsporangium inside it contains spore mother cells pollen mother cell or spore mother cell it has undergone meiotic division the spore mother cell is diploid it has undergone meiotic division to make four microspores the microspore arrangement can be in different manners this manner they have given in ncrt this is isobilateral arrangement this is iso bilateral tetrad so the pollen grains can be 1 2 3 4 this is called linear tetrad it can be like this also it can be a t shaped tetrad also so 1 2 3 4 this is t shaped tetrad and it can be dicasate tetrad also in dicasate tetrad so one cell here second cell here third cell here the fourth cell as it's it's at the back so in dicasate tetrad one two three cells this is the whole third cell and the fourth cell is at the back of that that is called dicasate tetrad and if we have to see tetrahedral shape in tetrahedral shape so one pollen grain second pollen grain third pollen grain the fourth pollen grain will be behind the fourth pollen grain will be behind okay so 1 2 3 and this is the fourth pollen grain this is called tetrahedral tetrad this is called tetrahedral tetrad so all together from one pollen mother cell four pollen grains will be formed in different manners they will be there in different manners the pollen grains are arranged and the tapetum secretes callase enzyme to dissolve the callose wall and they will release the pollen grains out right so let us see that this process is called as microsporogenesis which involves meiotic division now when we see 
a pollen tit this is a callous wall one pollen second pollen third pollen fourth pollen when the callous layer dissolves then the pollen grain comes out the pollen grain comes out in ncrt they have given this picture so each pollen grain comes out what is this this is called as microspore or we can call it as pollen grain now the pollen grain what is the dimension of the pollen grain it is 25 to 50 micrometers in diameter the size of the pollen grain is 25 to 50 micrometers in diameter and the pollen grain has prominent nucleus it has prominent nucleus it has abundant cytoplasm and the cytoplasm is surrounded by plasma membrane the cytoplasm is surrounded by plasma membrane and the plasma membrane is surrounded by spore coat the plasma membrane is surrounded by spore coat now the spore coat of pollen grain has two walls outer wall and inner wall this is a outer wall the outer wall of the pollen grain is called exine this is a inner wall the inner wall of pollen grain is called intine now the exine of pollen grain is rough in appearance exine is rough intine is smooth exine is thick in nature intine is thin in nature exine is discontinuous intine is continuous means in time throughout the pollen grain it will be there but exine like it is rough right so here it is here it is here it is at this place exine is absent at this place exine is absent at this place exine is absent the place where exine is absent it makes a germ pore the place where exine is absent it makes a germ pore right so that is why we are telling exine is discontinuous intine is continuous now the place where exine is absent it is called germ pore and exine is made up of a fatty substance intine is made up of carbohydrate substance the name of the fatty substance is called sporopollen what is the name of the fatty substance sporo pollen the name of the in uh, carbohydrate substance is called pectocellulose it is pectocellulose because of this sporopollen sporopollen it is the strongest hardest material of the plant body the sporopollen is the strongest and hardest material of the plant body the sporopollen is resistant to acids it is resistant to bases it is resistant to heat it is resistant to cold even it is resistant to enzymes also because of the sporopollen only the pollen grains can be preserved as fossils palino fossils we can preserve them understood children okay now the study of pollen grains is called as palinology the study of pollen grains is called as palinology now we are studying the pollen grain structure only pollen grain is haploid because it is formed after meiotic division and it represents the male gametophyte the pollen grain represents the male gametophyte and this pollen grain it has abundant cytoplasm prominent nucleus surrounded by cell membrane and surrounded by spore coat this outer spore coat is called exine the inner spore coat is called intine exine is thick exine is responsible for this ornamental design exine is discontinuous exine is made up of a fatty substance called sporopollen which is the hardest substance now the design which i have given you this is a reticulate design which type of ornamental designs it can give it can give reticulate design it can give spiny design and it can give tuberculous design tuberculous design means it will be like this it can give tuberculous design or sometimes it can be even smooth also 
it can be even smooth also in time it is continuous it is thin it is made up of pectin and cellulose now because of presence of these many nutrients now what is the importance of pollen grain now it became fashion nowadays to take pollen grains as food supplements it is taken as food supplements since they are rich in nutrients since they are rich in nutrients it is taken as food supplements now this if it is taken by athletes and if it is given for race horses it increases the performance now how it is taken it is taken in the form of tablets and syrups it's taken in the form of tablets or syrups and consuming pollen grain became fashion nowadays so this is a significance of pollen grains what is the disadvantage of pollen grains what is the disadvantage of pollen grains now pollen grains in sensitized people in hypersensitized people it causes pollen allergy it causes pollen allergy pollen allergy is called as hay fever pollen allergy is called as hay fever take a screenshot we will continue hi yes we were discussing about pollen grain when we have to see pollen grain development now this is pollen tetrad when the callus layer dissolves the pollen grains will come out right so the callus layer is there intact here now when the callus layer dissolves in ncrt they showed us this is a pollen grain which is having nucleus and abundant cytoplasm this is called one celled pollen grain what is it called one celled pollen grain now this cell enlarges cell enlargement will happen when the cell is getting enlarged now it develops vacuole inside it so it develops vacuoles inside it and this is the nucleus of it and this is the cytoplasm now it grows further big now when it grows further big it starts division it starts division now we have to make it little more big and we have to show it is dividing it develops a big vacuole and asymmetric spindle will be formed when it is dividing it forms spindle so now this nucleus is undergoing division it forms an asymmetric spindle like structure this is vacuole and this is asymmetric spindle and this is the cytoplasm of the pollen grain this is dividing pollen grain in ncrt in the next picture they have given us after division it will become a two celled pollen grain it will become a two celled pollen grain in which the smaller cell this is the smaller cell the smaller cell is called as generative cell the smaller cell is called as generative cell and this is the bigger cell it is called as vegetative cell it's called vegetative cell it is also called as tube cell the tube cell is big and the generative cell is small the tube cell is in this manner and the generative cell is spindle shaped it is spindle shaped structure this vegetative cell has a large irregular nucleus the vegetative cell has a large irregular nucleus and abundant cytoplasm prominent cytoplasm and the generative cell also has a nucleus and it also has its own cytoplasm the generative cell is spindle shaped it is small and it floats in the cytoplasm of this vegetative cell now this is a pollen grain but having two cells in it it is called two celled pollen grain what is this stage called this is called two celled pollen grain what are the two cells children one is a vegetative cell which is big other one is a generative cell which is small this is called two celled pollen grain now when the anther splits we say it is dehiscence in the ncrt they have given a picture that the anther is undergoing dehiscence like this and the this is a connective and these are the pollen grains which are releasing out so when the anther wall bursts they showed us a picture in this manner 
right so when the anther wall bursts this region where it is bursting is called as stomium at the stomium the anther wall will undergo dehiscence and it will release the pollen grains in 60% of the plants in 60% of the plants the pollen grains are shed in the two celled stage one vegetative cell and in one generative cell in that stage the anther walls will split and the pollen grains will be coming out so see these are the two celled pollen grains in 60% of the plants pollen grains are shed in two celled stage they come out from the anther in the two cell stage by air or by wind or by insect they go and land on the stigma so they go and land on the stigma these pollen grains will come and land on the stigma and after landing on the stigma after landing on the stigma this generative cell will do one more mitotic division and it makes two male gametes so then after landing on the stigma what happens the generative cell will undergo one more mitotic division and it makes two male gametes so then this which is having one vegetative cell and two male gametes is called three celled stage of the pollen grain so this what is this called this is called three celled stage of pollen grain so in 60% of the plants uh, dehiscence happens in the two cell stage and it comes and lands on the stigma after coming and landing on the stigma then it completes its next division and it makes two male gametes like this whereas in the remaining 40% of the plants it will complete that division also inside the anther only and then in directly in the three cell stage it comes out and lands on the stigma it comes out and lands on the stigma understood children till here now when we are talking about pollen grain it's important to mention about pollen allergy it's important to mention about pollen allergy so there is a plant which is called as parthenium plant parthenium histrophorum this parthenium plant it is native of american tropics now it came to india how did it come to india when we are importing the wheat along with it imported wheat parthenium came to india and it became an invasive weed it grows everywhere and it is causing pollen allergy right it causes pollen allergy the pollen allergy is called as hay fever okay it causes asthma breathing difficulties and it causes bronchitis also what do you mean by bronchitis inflammation of the bronchi is called as bronchitis i'll show you the parthenium plant yeah this is a parthenium plant i made a small video on the parthenium plant i'll share you the link description I'll, i'll share you the link in the description box you can look about the information related to parthenium from that video this is the parthenium plant so keep it away it produces a toxin called parthenin so which causes respiratory diseases so it is toxic for animals also for some people it causes asthma and it causes bronchitis because of the presence of a toxin called dangerous respiratory toxin called parthenin this is parthenium okay so this they have mentioned in ncrt textbook so it is there in the garden so i brought it so now the last topic about pollen grain is called as pollen viability it is pollen viability viability means it should be alive then only it can come and land on the stigma then only the pollen grain can make the pollen tube and it can send the pollen uh, male gametes inside so after breaking the anther walls when the pollen grain is coming out uh within how much time it should come and land on the stigma it depends upon the pollen viability in ncrt they are mentioned about pollen viability they told in some plants like rice right and in grasses the pollen grain viability it lose its viability within 30 minutes means after 30 minutes the pollen grain is dead so after 30 minutes it goes and lands on the stigma no use it cannot germinate the pollen grain cannot germinate so in grasses in rice wheat and in grasses the pollination or the pollen grain should go and land on the stigma within 30 minutes itself whereas if you go with other families like roseaceae leguminaceae solanaceae there the pollen grain is viable for months 
together it can nicely uh, roam around and it can go and fall on the stigma because the pollen viability is for months together so this is about pollen viability now when we talk about crop breeding programs see i showed you parthenium now in the same manner if we go to other country we like some plants there so we want to bring it to our country so then it's not possible if you think it's not possible we can't carry it in uh, airplanes and like that then we can bring their pollen grains but if at all if the pollen grains viability is within 30 minutes after 30 minutes if it dies then how will you bring it means there is a technique the name of the technique is called cryo preservation the name of the technique is called cryo preservation it is also called lyophilization cryo preservation or lyophilization is a technique it's a preservation technique we can store the pollen grains in animal breeding they'll store the sperm in plant breeding we store the pollen grains where male gametes are there we can store the Uh, sperms or we can store the pollen grains in this technique at in liquid nitrogen we will store at minus 196 degree centigrade in which nitrogen in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degree centigrade when we are storing any sample that technique is called as cryo preservation the significance of this cryo preservation is the sample will be viable for years together the sample will be viable for years together so then you can um, do whenever you want crop breeding programs children all this is information about the male part now let's go into the female reproductive structure which is called as pistil take a screenshot we'll continue right now let us talk about the female reproductive structure the horal is gynoecium in gynoecium pistil will be there which is a female reproductive organ so now let us talk about pistil it is also called carpel it's called pistil or it is called carpel right what is pistil or carpel it represents the female reproductive organ of a plant it represents the female reproductive organ of the flower now if the flower is having only one pistil then it is called as monocarpellary if the flower has one pistil if it has one pistil what is it called mono carpellary condition now if the flower if it is having many pistils if it is having many pistils then it is called as multi carpellary condition then it is called as multi carpellary condition if it is having many pistils now we have a doubt are all the pistils fused or this are they separate now if they are fused what is that condition called if the carpels are unfused what is that condition if they are separate what is that condition called if it is fused it is called syncarpous condition multi carpellary syncarpous condition now if they are unfused they separate from each other then that is called multi carpellary apocarpous condition right in ncert they have given the parts of the carpel or pistil a carpel or pistil has three parts the three parts are first one is the stigma next part will be style and the third bottom swelled portion is called as ovary in ncert they have given us the picture of hibiscus pistil hibiscus pistil the stigma is pentacarpellary they have given the picture like this so this is pentacarpellary stigma and here it has anthers yellow colored bunch of anthers will be there here right so uh, we need not draw this because it is andrisium so this is stigma what is this this is stigma and this is style and at the bottom ovary will be there this is a ovary and ovary is on thalamus or receptacle 
right inside the ovary ovarian compartments will be there ovarian locules will be there inside the ovary ovarian compartments or locules will be there they are called locules now inside the locules there is a ridge or bridge which is called placenta now attach it to the placenta if you take hibiscus it is pentalocular so one two three four five five locules are there at the center placenta is there now attached to the placenta small tiny ovules will be there so this is a ovule these are the ovules now these are the parts of a carpel or pistil stigma style and ovary now the stigma this is a stigma what is the function of the stigma i told you now pollen grain comes and lands on the stigma that means stigma acts as a landing platform for pollen grain it acts as a landing platform for pollen grain and style is the region through which the pollen tube will descend down sending the male gametes inside so style through which through the style only the pollen tube will descend it will descend and it will reach the ovary now ovary it is the bottom portion which is sitting on the thalamus in which compartments will be there in which ovules are there ovary is the bottom bulger portion it is the bottom bulger portion which contains ovules the ovary contains ovules right now we were telling that this is one carpel if the carpels are many and if they are fused the condition is called syncarpus condition in ncrt they have given example for a syncarpus condition as mycelia what example they have given mycelia example they have given right i'm sorry they have given the example of papaver Michael is example of apocarpus condition. For syncarpus condition, papaver somnifera, poppy plant, they have given us the example. If we have to see the picture of fused syncarpus condition, so like this, it is this is the ovary, and this is the thalamus, and here is the fused carpels many carpels are there so we can make out one two three four five carpels are there and all of them are fused what is this condition called this is multi-carpillary syncarpus condition example we wrote there papaver somnifera poppy plant right and if we have to see examples of multicarpillary apocarpus condition as i told they have given example of mycelia we can take the example of magnolia also anona also we can take the example of apocarpus condition where we can see the thalamus on the thalamus we can see many ovules are there sorry many carpels are there but each carpel is separate from each other it's not fusing here all the carpels are fused but here the carpels are separate from each other so this condition is called as apocarpus condition many carpels but separate what is it called it is apocarpus condition found in mycelia magnolia anona plant right now this what is this this is carpel now if you come to see the part stigma style and ovary we told that the ovary contains placenta in the uh, attached to the placenta ovules will be there now what is the shape of a typical ovule of angiosperm means it is anatropus ovule what is the shape of the ovule the shape of the ovule is anatropus ovule it is anatropus ovule take a screenshot we will continue right if we have to see the ovule what is the ovule called as ovule is also named as megasporangium microsporangium is there inside the anther megasporangium means ovule so we are talking about 
angiosperm ovule its typical shape is anna tropus ovule now anatropus ovule shows 180 degrees rotation it shows 180 degrees rotation usually in gymnosperms the ovule is orthotropus orthotropus means this is a body of the ovule and this is an integument of the ovule one integument will be there unitegmic ama this is the stalk of the ovule the stalk of the ovule is generally called as funicle right and this represents the base of the ovule calazal end and this represents the apex which is called micropyle now if the micropyle calazal end and funicle end are on the same axis now such an ovule is called orthotropous ovule we can see it in gymnosperms whereas in angiosperms we are telling it is anatropous ovule so what is the shape of an anatropous ovule means this is the body one integument and this is the second integument and here is the stalk this is the stalk and second integument right this is the second integument this shape is called as anatropous ovule in anatropous ovule if you see where is the stalk this is the stalk the stalk represents funicle the stalk of the ovule is called funicle ovule is also called megasporangium it is called megasporangium the stalk of the megasporangium or ovule is called funicle this is the body of the ovule here is the base the basal end represents calazal end and this is the apex represents the micropylar end what end is this micropylar end and the calazal end now here the degree is 180 degree rotation i told now see this is 0 degrees rotation now from 0 if you rotate like this then it is 90 degrees rotation now it did not rotate this much it rotated further down it rotated further down see this if you rotate 90 degrees it will be like this right it will be like this it did not rotate 90 it further rotated means it still bent down like this it has further rotated like this now this is 90 plus 90 180 degrees rotation right so that's why we tell the typical anatropous ovule rotation is 180 degrees rotation right children understood to understand 180 degrees rotation i brought from orthotropous ovule so now in anatropous ovule which two parts are near means you can tell that the micropylar end is near to the funicle and calazal end is opposite far away first point the next point is now this is a body of the ovule the body of the ovule fuses to the stalk at a point at a junction called hilum so this junction this is the junction where the stalk is fusing with the body and this junction point is called as hilum amma this is neat 2020 question they asked this in neat 2020 examination so they asked the funicle fuses with the body of the ovule at the answer is hilum now this is the body at the hilum both of them they fused and it is covered by the ovule is not naked it is covered by two integuments outer integument and inner integument this is outer integument and here is the inner integument protective function this is a inner integument and all this is the mass this mass which is filled with cells is called as nucellus 
which is a nutritive tissue all this is filled with a mass what is that mass called it is called as nucellar cells which is a nutritive function intake means protective function new cell is nutritive function right and this represents the colossal end the basal end colossal end represents the basal end and this represents the epical end now this is called as megasporangium now we have to talk about megasporogenesis we have to talk about megasporogenesis in ncrt they have given us in ncrt they have given the process of megasporogenesis now see carefully now this new cell is in ncrt they showed us this is micro pilar end and this showed us one big cell at the micro pilar end surrounded by small cells all these are new cellular cells only look at this picture in ncrt children there's one picture like this now in this all the peripheral cells are smaller whereas this cell the cell the new cellular cell right the new cellular cell at the micro pilar end becomes big and behaves like a megaspore mother cell the cell the new cellular cell only but which is towards a micro pilar end will grow big and it will behave like a megaspore mother cell now we know megaspore mother cell means it has to undergo meiotic division it has to undergo meiotic division take a screenshot of the ovule yes now if it undergoes meiosis 1 it will make megaspore dyad it will complete meiosis 2 also and it will make megaspore tetrad so it will do meiosis 1 after doing meiosis 1 right this cell will become two cells surrounded by all these peripheral cells right so now what is this called this is called megaspore dyad now this megaspore dyad will complete meiosis 2 it will complete meiosis 2 and then it will make four cells so 1 2 3 and this is the fourth cell after completing meiosis 2 and all these are the surrounding new cellular cells and this end is micro pilar end epical end and this end will be colossal end now after completing meiosis 2 four megaspores are formed 1 2 3 4 this is called megaspore tetrad it is called megaspore tetrad now four megaspores are formed out of which three megaspores towards the micro pilar end will degenerate and one megaspore towards the colossal end will remain functional see 1 2 3 all these three cells are smaller because they are degenerating the three megaspores towards the micro pilar end will degenerate and the megaspore this is the megaspore the megaspore which is towards the colossal end which is towards the colossal end will remain functional it will remain functional now this functional one functional megaspore will develop female gametophyte which is called as embryo sac understood now these three have degenerated only one will be there this picture is there in ncrt after that what they have done they have taken only one functional megaspore so this is a functional megaspore which is at the colossal end so now this functional megaspore it undergoes free nuclear divisions it undergoes free nuclear divisions it will undergo free nuclear divisions one nuclei will divide and it will make two nuclei now because it is undergoing free nuclear divisions it will undergo one more division and it will make two nuclei this time they will become four nuclei now one more free nuclear division four nuclei will become 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 eight nuclei it will become now till here it is just doing free nuclear divisions after that it will go for cytokinesis 
after that it will go for cytokinesis when it is undergoing cytokinesis what happens when it is undergoing cytokinesis now out of this eight nuclei three nuclei will move towards one side three nuclei will move towards colossal end they move towards colossal end they take bit of cytoplasm they make their own walls and they become three cells they are called as vegetative cells or they are called antipodal cells so let us take of this three nuclei and go towards that end they are having their own walls they will take bit of cytoplasm and these are at the colossal end and they are called antipodals antipodal cells they are now three more nuclei will also take little bit of cytoplasm and they will also make their own walls and they will move towards a micropylar end this is colossal end means this is micropylar end towards the micropylar end again three more nuclei are moving this is one cell this is the other cell and this is the other cell now these three together it's called as egg apparatus three together what is it called it is called egg apparatus in the egg apparatus the two lateral cells are called synergids and the central cell is called egg cell now this is the middle cell which is called egg and these two lateral ones are called as synergids these two lateral cells are called as synergids now these synergids at the micropylar end they have finger like projections the finger like projections are called as filiform apparatus the synergids which are at the micropylar end they have finger like projections which are called as they are called as filiform apparatus the filiform apparatus will guide the pollen tube which is bringing the male gametes to reach the egg now these are the filiform apparatus now what else they have the synergid should have their nuclei you know so where do the synergids have nuclei means they have nuclei here and they have vacuole here whereas in the case of egg vacuole will be here and the nucleus will be on the top the nucleus is located here so if you see three cells went up became antipodals three cells went down and they became egg apparatus so here one nucleus is left out and here one nucleus is left out the two nuclei means six out of eight nuclei are surrounded by walls the remaining two nuclei are not surrounded by walls they remain as polar nuclei and they will suspend in the center in the central large central cell they will suspend now these two are the leftover nuclei they are not surrounded by walls they are suspended in the large central cell and they are called as polar nuclei they are called as polar nuclei which are suspended in the large central cell so all this is the large central cell space all this is the large central cell space now this is a picture which is called embryo sac what is this called female gametophyte or embryo sac now if you count the female gametophyte or embryo sac contains how many cells 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 7 celled how many nuclei 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so the female gametophyte or the embryo sac is eight nucleated seven cell this is asked in neat 2021 examination the female gametophyte is how many cell it is seven cell and eight nucleated right children in that if you see the function of antipodals they don't have any role they will degenerate the function of the polar nuclei will make the endosperm the function of the synergids will guide the entry of the pollen tube which is bringing the male gametes the function of the egg it is the female gamete right understood take a screenshot we'll continue right so we finished the female gamete also we have seen the female gamete egg and we have seen the male gamete also now the next process is pollination 
now the anther has undergone dehiscence it has released the pollen grains now the process of transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma is called as pollination so what is pollination now we are going to talk about pollination what is pollination it is the process of transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma children in plants both male and female gametes are non motile in humans male gamete the sperm has a long flagellate can swim and come whereas in the case of plants both male and female gametes are non motile so they should be uh, taken by an agent so that process is called as pollination the process called pollination depending upon the source of the pollen there are three types of pollinations depending on the source of pollen grain three types of pollinations are there the first pollination is called as autogamy the second pollination is called as gynogamy and the third pollination is called as xenogamy there are three types of pollination one is autogamy another one is gynogamy and the third one is xenogamy now autogamy is called self pollination autogamy is called self pollination now what do you mean by self pollination in self pollination take a plant we'll take a flower right this is the thalamus this is the stigma style and ovary and this is stamen now petals right so in autogamy self pollination the pollen grains from the stamen come and land on the stigma of the same flower if the pollination is happening within the flower of the same plant so what is self pollination pollination happened in one flower in one plant so then that is self pollination only that is self pollination only right now self pollination advantages what are the advantages no need of pollinator assured com uh, compulsory pollination will happen assured seed set will be there but the disadvantage is continuous self pollination continuous inbreeding leads to inbreeding depression it leads to inbreeding depression it leads to loss of vitality loss of vigor and all those things right now if you see uh, for autogamy in ncrt they were talking about two types of flowers called cleistogamous flowers and chasmogamous flowers cleistogamous flower and chasmogamous flower now cleistogamous flower clister fist close to flowers they are cleistogamous flowers are closed flowers chasmogamous flowers means they are open flowers cleistogamous flowers are geotrophic they are inside the soil they cannot open they will be like bud only so cleistogamous flowers are geotrophic they remain like a bud only they will never open chasmogamous flowers are aerial flowers means they are phototrophic they are phototrophic they bloom they open now in cleistogamous flower the stamen and the pistil are near to each other and nothing is coming inside so cleistogamous flowers invariably they have to participate in self pollination only there's no other go there's no other go so if my door is locked i can't go outside means i have to cook inside only i have to eat i cannot order from outside so like that it is cleistogamous flowers are closed flowers they are, they have to invariably undergo self pollination only whereas chasmogamous flowers so they can go with uh, self pollination also they can go with cross pollination also now there are three plants here to be mentioned one is called as viola the second one is called as oxalis and the third one is called as 
Kamalina Bangaliensis. Now, I made a small video on these plants. Again, I'll share the link in the description box. You can look at those plants. So, if we see the images, it will be better for us to remember it for more time. So, Viola, Oxalis and Kamalina plants I have collected and I have sh I'll have share you that link. Watch that video. It is for two minutes only. Now, Viola, the common name of Viola is called as common pansy. It is called as common pansy. Now, oxalis. Oxalis, it is a weed. It is a grass plant. It has beautiful fan-shaped leaves. It has. It is a grass-like plant. And Kamalina bangalensis, it is a dicot plant. All the Kamalina bangalensis plant, they have given in NCRT picture. All these three plants, why are we mentioning means? They have both cleistogamous flowers and casmogamous flowers. They have closed flowers in the soil. They have casmogamous flowers, colored flowers, uh, blue-colored flowers aerially. Now, these flowers, closed flowers autogamy only open flowers they go with cross pollination understood children take a screenshot then we'll talk about gynogamy and xenogamy right now when we have to talk about autogamy it is self pollination 100% self pollination we discussed about advantages and disadvantages also now coming to gynogamy gynogamy we need to specify let me draw one flower here another flower here stigma style ovary this is the stamen and the petals now here we are drawing one more stigma style ovary and these are the stamens and here what is this this is the petal now in gynogamy pollen grains will move from one flower to another flower Pollen grains will move from one flower to another flower, but of the same plant. But of the same plant. The pollen grains from here come and land on this stigma. And these pollens will go and land on this stigma. So, here the pollination is happening between two flowers, but of the same plant. It is between two flowers, but of the same plant. Since it is of the same plant, genes will be same. So, means genetically it is self-pollination. But functionally, if you see, it is cross-pollination. So, gynogamy children. So, what we need to write? It is functionally functionally it is cross-pollination. Right? Whereas, if we talk about genes, the genes are the same. So, genetically it is self-pollination only. So, it is something like hybrid. Cross-pollination also we are telling. Self-pollination also we are telling. This is called as gynogamy. Where can we find gynogamy means in maize plant. In maize plant, unisexual male flower, the tessel inflorescence will be on the top of the plant. The female inflorescence corn cob, what we eat, will be at the axis of the leaf. From there, from the male flower, the pollen grains will come and fall on the female inflorescence. But of the same plant. That's called gynogamy. We Beautiful example for gynogamy will be maize plant. Now coming to xenogamy. So this is 100% self-pollination. This is 50-50. Xenogamy means 100% cross-pollination. It is. It is 100% cross-pollination. Now 100% cross-pollination means we are going to draw two plants here. So one plant and the another plant. Now on one plant, stigma style ovary these are the stamens and this is the petal this is one flower and another flower will show it here of another plant now in xenogamy the pollen grains will move from one flower to another flower from one plant to another plant also from this plant to this plant also these pollens will come and drop here these pollens will go and drop here. So, the exchange is happening between two flowers and two plants. So, here two flowers but same plant. But here we will tell two flowers and two plants also. That means it is 100% cross pollination. This is 100% cross pollination. So, this is the classification of pollination depending upon the type of the pollen grain. Take a screenshot, then we will talk about the type of pollination depending upon the agents, right? Take a screenshot. 
when we talk about the agents then we tell abiotic pollination and biotic pollination under abiotic pollination wind pollination will come and water pollination will come in biotic pollination living organisms will come so when we have to talk about abiotic agents of pollination and biotic agents of pollination under abiotic agents we have two types one is wind pollination the other one is water pollination children wind pollination is called anemophily water pollination is called hydrophily abiotic pollination is rare biotic pollination is common biotic pollination means by animals by living agents so pollination by animals it is called zoophily in that under we are telling biotic pollination is common under that insect pollination is more common so if the pollination is by insects that is called entomophily if the pollination is by birds then it is called ornithophily if the pollination is by ants myrmecophily if the pollination is by snails then it is called malacophily if the pollination is by bats it is chiropterophily if the pollination is by reptiles snakes and lizards then ophiophily if the pollination is by squirrels then it is called as thriophily pollination by squirrels is called as thriophily right so these are different types of pollination which is done by living agents now coming to abiotic agents wind pollination is called anemophily water pollination is called hydrophily wind pollination is little more when compared to hydrophily hydrophily occurs in monocots it occurs in monocots it occurs in aquatic plants not all the aquatic plants only 30 genera only 30 genera of monocots they participate in hydrophily take a screenshot yeah so when we talk about hydrophily 30 genera we are telling now we'll talk about anemophily then we'll go to hydrophily in anemophily which plants show anemophily it is common in grasses it is common in grasses like rice wheat all those things will go with anemophily now if the pollen grain has to travel by wind what should be the characteristics of wind pollinated flowers the pollen grain should be lightweight pollen grain should be of light weight the pollen grain need not be colorful color nectar perfume scent nothing colorless odorless the next one tasteless right nothing is required then since they are traveling by wind so they might reach the stigma or they might miss also so it's a hit and miss fire so that is why the pollen grain should be produced enormously they should be lightweight pollen grains are non sticky they should not stick so that they can fly easily so no nectar no perfume right and no color pollen grains are enormous in number pollen grains should be enormous in number now what should be the characters of the pistil if the pistil has to catch the wind borne pollen grain means it should be long and it should be feathery so the stigma should be long and it should be feathery so that it can trap the air borne pollen grains so that it can borne the it, it can trap the air borne pollen grains and this anemophily is quite com common in grasses so this anemophily pollen grains only will cause 
pollen allergy hay fever right they'll be in the wind and in the sensitized people it causes asthma bronchitis severe chronic respiratory disorders right children so that is about eniophily now let's go to hydrophily hydrophily is exhibited by monocots it's exhibited by aquatic plants not all aquatic plants if you take lotus if you take water lily if you take icornia water hyanth these are having beautiful flowers if it is attracting means it is attracting an insect so it is insect pollination then so but it is in water so that means all the hydrophytes are not uh, participating in water pollination so water pollinated plants if we have to take down the examples they come under 30 genera the examples of water pollination are so we can take the example of Valisneria, which is called as ribbon grass this is a common name the other one is called as hydrilla plant so Valisneria and hydrilla both of them are freshwater plants they are freshwater plants and when we take about a marine grass marine sea grass if you tell that is zoostera marina zoostera marina it's an example of sea grass it's an example of seagrass now these plants will show hydrophily pollination happens in water in ncrt they have given the examples of valisneria they have given the picture of valisneria valisneria is an unisexual plant male plant separate female plant separate and the plant is submerged in the freshwater body the male plant it releases the male flowers the male flowers will be of lightweight and they'll be floating on the surface of the water the female plant has a long coiled style and when this uh, when it is matured it will uncoil and it will come it will keep the stigma on the surface of the water and through the water currents it takes the pollen grains male gametes that means fertilization is happening above the surface of the water right so this type of water pollination which happens on the surface of the water in valisneria is called as epi hydrophily epihydrophily means pollination happening on the surface of the water hypohydrophily means pollination happens inside the water body zoostera is also submerged plant only but sea water will be of more depth right so the plant cannot come up so that means the pollen grains will be released inside the water zoostera marina pollen grains are long ribbon like they'll be having the same surface tension as that of the sea water so that they can swim they, they will not sink they will not float they will have the same density so that they'll swim they will reach the female plant and they do the fertilization inside the water only such hydrophily is called hypohydrophily inside the water so it is called hypo hydrophily now what are the characteristics that the hydrophilus flask should bear so the pollen grain of zoostera we told it is long ribbon like and it should have a mucilaginous coating non wetty coating it should have and the stigma and style should be long and it should be coiled to go up and to receive the pollen grains so these are the characteristics of hydrophilus flask in hydrophilus flask also the pollen grains might reach or might not reach so in abiotic pollination the pollen grains are always numerous in number take a screenshot then we will talk about biotic pollination right in biotic pollination which pollination is common entomophily insect pollination is common in insects which type of insects will come majority bees will come because they need to collect the honey so bees will come moth will come beetles will come wasp will come ants will come all this comes under insect pollination only entomophily which is very common in that bees are very common agents of pollination now why the bee is visiting the flower if you see the garden if you just observe some flowers early morning if you see bees will visit them so why are they visiting so the at the base of the ovary nectar glands will be there so the insects want to collect the honey even the mosquito also will feed on the honey only for collecting that nectar the insect will come or some edible pollens will be there to eat the edible pollens also the insect will come and or sometimes the flower might even provide space for the insect to lay the eggs also so for laying eggs insects will come in that act what happens the anther will undergo dehiscence the anther will split and the pollen grains will be released so in 
in entomophily the pollinates will be sticky so that they can stick to the surface right of the they can stick to the body they can stick to the wings or they can stick to the legs the pollinates will be traveling uh, with on the body to another plant to another flower and the pollination will be happening so in entomophilus flowers what are the characteristics sticky pollen grains it's the first characteristic and the flower should provide floral rewards to make the insect to come again and again so that the insect can revisit again what are the floral rewards nectar honey or edible pollen grains or giving space to legs there is a biggest flower you know which is called as amorphophyllus it is six feet tall flower if it is such a big tall flower yeah it can give space for the insect to lay the eggs so the flower provides floral rewards sometimes by giving space for the insect to lay the eggs also now such a beautiful relation is exhibited by a moth called pronuba moth and yucca plant yucca plant will have fig inflorescence so this is a inflorescence swollen thalamus in which unisexual flowers will be there now at this place male flowers will be there at the bottom fertile female flowers will be there and at this place sterile gall flowers sterile female flowers will be there the insect blastophaga right the insect is coming inside to lay the eggs so on the insect body we know it carries the sticky pollen grains it will come inside why it is coming inside to lay the eggs so it will go inside and it will drop these pollen grains on this female flowers that means female flowers have undergone fertilization now where it will lay the eggs it will lay the eggs on these gall flowers sterile flowers anywhere they are sterile so the insect will lay its eggs in the sterile gall flowers and while it is going up it picks the pollen grains from these male flowers it will pick the pollen grains from the male flowers it will go and it will pollinate the other one so in yucca and pronuba moth we can see the symbiotic mutualistic association so this is about biotic pollination characteristics of entomophilus flowers right now take a screenshot we will talk about outbreeding devices then now inbreeding means self pollination outbreeding means cross pollination now inbreeding leads to inbreeding depression so that's why the plants discourage self pollination and they encourage cross pollination by doing certain mechanisms which come under outbreeding devices it come under out breeding devices there are four means of discouraging self pollination and promoting cross pollination now why because continuous self pollination leads to inbreeding depression that is why they discourage and they go for outbreeding what are the four mechanisms the first one is called as dichogamy what is the first one dichogamy the second one is called as hercogamy the third one is called as self incompatibility and the fourth one is called as uni sexuality the four methods are dichogamy hercogamy self incompatibility and unisexuality dichogamy the name itself tells that even though it's a bisexual flower there is no synchronization either andrisium will mature first or gynesium will mature first so in dichogamy there is no synchronization between there's no synchronization between the anther release the pol between the pollen release and the stigma receptivity right between the stigma receptivity if the andrisium matures first by the time still stigma is not matured that condition is called protandry in protandry what happens male will mature first the andrisium matures early in some other cases you know the gynesium will mature early what is it called protogyny so it is called proto 
gynae. Protandry and protogyne are examples of dichogamy. There is no synchronization. Now second one is hercogamy. Hercogamy means the andrisium and gynesium either they are in different directions either they are in different directions or they are at different lengths one is this side and other one is this side so they cannot uh, transfer the pollen grains like this so either they are in different directions or they are in different lengths then also pollination self pollination will not happen that is hercogamy the third one is self incompatibility in self incompatibility when the self pollen comes and lands on the stigma when the, this is the self pollen when it comes and lands on the stigma the stigma will not receive it the stigma will release uh, will accept the different type of pollen grain so means self incompatibility so if it is its own it will not uh, receive it it will reject this and it will accept this that is called as self incompatibility and the last one is called as unisexuality unisexuality means male plant and female plant male flower and female flower are separate under unisexuality we have two conditions monoecious condition and dioecious condition what do you mean by monoecious condition in monoecious condition the unisexual male flower and this is the unisexual female flower unisexual female flower where only pistil is there unisexual male flower where only stamen is there if unisexual male and female flowers are present on the same plant if unisexual male and female flowers on same plant then that is called monoecious condition dioecious condition so two plants separate plants one plant will have gynesium the other plant will have only stamens now this is the female plant and this is a male plant if both are separate that is dioecious condition now in this condition gynogamy can happen right so in that condition gynogamy will also not happen so in monoecious condition what happens so this pollen grains can come and land on this one that's called gynogamy so in unisexuality monoecious condition only autogamy can be prevented only autogamy can be prevented but gynogamy occurs whereas in dioecious condition since they are completely separate both autogamy and gynogamy are prevented it is 100% outbreeding so because two plants are separate both auto and gynogamy are prevented in this case so this is about outbreeding devices take a screenshot then we'll talk about pollen pistil interactions yeah now when we talk about pollen pistil interaction so we have seen here that means the pistil has an ability to recognize whether it is a compatible pollen or non compatible pollen that concept is called as pollen pistil interactions with the advancement of new tools and techniques scientists recently only came to know that like see i am communicating with you in english i am teaching so you are understanding the concept in the same manner we are communicating in english language english dialogues we are doing now the pollen and pistil also they exchange their dialogues but not in english not in any other language they exchange chemical dialogues that is called as pollen pistil interaction so what's the next concept it is called pollen pistil interaction it is called pollen pistil interaction only recent days the scientists came to know that the pistil has the ability it has the ability to identify the right pollen it has the ability to identify right pollen means compatible it can identify the compatible pollen if it is a right pollen then it will allow it to germinate if it is a right pollen it will allow it to do post pollination post pollination means it allow it to do undergo fertilization and if at all if it is a wrong pollen 
if it's a wrong pollen means non compatible right if it is a non compatible pollen then it rejects it it rejects it so that means the scientists are telling there is a continuous dialogue between the pollen and the pistil through chemical mediators there is continuous dialogues between pollen grain and pistil there is continuous dialogues between pollen grain and pistil and the pistil will decide whether to permit it inside or not to permit inside now from the time the pollen grain comes and lands on the stigma till the pollen tube sends the male gametes to the egg from that point till the male gametes reaches the egg together are called as pollen pistil interactions right now in crop breeding programs in crop breeding programs what do we do crop breeding programs there's a technique called artificial hybridization there is a technique called artificial hybridization so we want to get superior varieties to generate superior varieties so we don't want uh, any other pollen grain to come and land on it we brought some superior pollen grains from a superior plant those pollen grains only we want to fertilize with this so what do we do so if it is a bisexual flower if it is a bisexual flower bisexual flower means it has both the reproductive parts it has stamens also and it has pistil also if it's a bisexual flower then we bring the scissors and we cut the anthers when do you cut the anthers we cut the anthers in the bud stage only cutting down the male part is called emasculation this process is called as emasculation so we will do this so that only the female part will be there intact with the flower and then by wind by insect also some unwanted pollen can come so that is why after doing emasculation the first step what do we do next we bring a bag and we tie it off so this second step is called bagging so why do we do bagging to prevent contamination to prevent unwanted pollen grains to come and uh, disturb this now when the pistil gets matured then we have stored some pollen grains cryopreservation those desired superior pollen grains we will bring and then we will open the bag we will open the bag and then we will dust the pollen grains and then again we will rebag it again we will rebag it this we will do if it is a bisexual flower if it is a unisexual flower then we need not do emasculation no unisexual flower means directly it is a female flower it is not having stamens with it so no need of emasculation directly you can bag it bring the pollen grains again open it again rebag it so this comes under artificial hybridization which comes under crop breeding programs so you can do between uh, non compatible things also you can do between different species you can do uh, pollination between different genera also which is not possible normally but through artificial uh, hybridization programs by using certain plant growth hormones we induce them to fuse with each other so that we get superior varieties so that we get superior varieties take a screenshot we'll continue next yes the next topic is double fertilization after pollen pistil interactions we told post pollination events will happen and the pollen grain will reach inside stigma style ovary right inside the ovary ovule inside the ovary ovule is there so here is a pollen grain here is the pollen grain the pollen grain has made a pollen tube the pollen tube is coming down it's bringing the male gametes and the pollen tube if it enters through the micropylar end 
if the pollen tube enters through the micropylar end to fuse with the egg which is here this process is called as porogamy this is a common type sometimes the pollen tube enters through the calazal end sometimes the pollen tube enters through the calazal end instead of coming this way if the pollen tube comes this way right then what is this called this is called calazogamy and sometimes it comes laterally like this way it comes sometimes the pollen tube enters through the integuments then that is called mesogamy if depending upon in which direction it is entering if it enters through the integuments if the pollen tube enters through the integuments mesogamy if it enters through the calazal end calazogamy if it enters through the micropylar end that is porogamy understood children now what happens inside we will see now the male gametes are coming through the pollen tube the male gametes are coming through the pollen tube if we see this end now here we have one synergid here is the other synergid and this is the egg cell now once these are the filiform apparatus right and this is a egg cell these are the filiform apparatus now one filiform this is one synergid and this is the second synergid this is the egg cell now one synergid will degenerate when the pollen tube is formed here itself when the pollen tube is formed then itself one synergid will degenerate why it is degenerating when it degenerate it secretes chemicals now this pollen tube can sense that chemicals and it will reach down so one synergid degenerates as the pollen tube is formed to secret chemicals and the pollen tube identifies that chemicals and it shows chemotactic movement so that means this synergid will not be there this synergid will not be there it has degenerated it has secreted chemicals now here you have excel and here you have the next synergid now this is a egg cell this is a degenerated synergid and this is a active synergid now the pollen tube is coming down it is bringing the male gametes it's bringing the male gametes so the second synergid it guides the pollen tube through this filiform apparatus the pollen tube is trying to enter inside after the pollen tube enters inside through the filiform apparatus then the second synergid also the second synergid also degenerates the second synergid also degenerate giving space for the male and female gametes to fuse now first synergid degenerates as soon as the pollen tube is formed the second synergid is degenerating when the pollen tube comes and touches that right so this movement of pollen tube towards the egg is called chemotactic movement what is that called it is called chemotactic movement towards the chemical it is getting attracted now it is bringing how many male gametes the generative cell has divided into two male gametes two male gametes will come now next what happens if you see now only egg is there and here is a large central cell where two polar nuclei are there and the pollen tube has brought two male gametes one male gamete and the second male gamete right now what happens see carefully now what is this these two are the polar nuclei these two are the male gametes two male gametes will be there but there is only one female gamete egg now then what happens the first male gamete there is a first male gamete one male gamete it fuses with egg male gamete female gamete fusion is called syngamy what is this called this is called syngamy or we can call it as generative fertilization it is also called generative fertilization the process of generative fertilization was identified by a scientist called strasburger 
identified this generative fertilization now syngamy when the male and female gametes are fused lead to formation of zygote so one male gamete comes and fuses with the female gamete and this develops into zygote this fertilization is called first fertilization is called generative fertilization then meanwhile what happens the two polar nuclei which are n and n they fuse the two polar nuclei they fuse to form what do they fuse they fuse to form secondary nuclei they are fusing to form secondary nuclei which will become 2n with this secondary nuclei the second male gamete with this secondary nuclei the second male gamete will fuse so these two are fusing when both of them they fuse then it becomes a 2n structure then what is it called this is called as secondary nuclei to the secondary nuclei the second male gamete will go and fuse so total how many things are fusing two polar nuclei and one male gamete three are fusing that is called triple fusion so then what happens triple fusion occurs now since the male gamete is fusing it is called second fertilization it is called second fertilization or we can call it as vegetative fertilization we can also call it as vegetative fertilization so triple fusion vegetative fertilization was identified by a scientist called nevasin this was identified by strasburger this fertilization is identified by nevasin what is triple fusion two polar nuclei fusing with the second male gamete is called as triple fusion now what is the product of the triple fusion the product of the triple fusion is pen primary endospermic nucleus which is triploid so one n second n third n three n's are fusing so it will be triploid in ploidy and what is it called endosperm primary endospermic nucleus which is a nutritive tissue so this when these three fuse it develops into pen primary endospermic nucleus which is triploid since two fertilizations have happened one is generative fertilization next is vegetative fertilization together it is called as double fertilization together it is called as double fertilization double fertilization and triple fusion both are observed by a scientist called nevasin only in a plant called fritillaria in a plant called fritillaria and lilium in fritillaria and lilium nevasin observed triple fusion and double fertilization double fertilization is a characteristic of angiosperms double fertilization is characteristic of angiosperms understood children so we finished double fertilization also take a screenshot we will talk about post fertilization events will discuss about post fertilization events pre fertilization gametogenesis and gamete transfer we discussed fertilization also we discussed right so coming to post fertilization event in fertilization we told angiosperms have double fertilization coming to post fertilization there are four events under post fertilization the first event is endosperm development the second event is embryo development and the third event is ovary maturing into fruit and the fourth event is ovule maturing into seed so endosperm formation is a post fertilization only and embryo developing embryo development also post fertilization only ovary converting into fruit also post fertilization only ovule developing into seed also post fertilization only and that the first side heading is endosperm formation the diagrams which i have already took on the board are with embryo developments we'll complete endosperm development and then we will go to embryo development now 
we have seen double fertilization in double fertilization we discussed the second fertilization triple fusion where three nuclei will fuse two are the polar nuclei and the next one is the second male gamete it results in formation of triploid pen primary endospermic nucleus which is there in the large central cell that large central cell now it will undergo divisions and it will make a tissue which is called as endosperm right now this endosperm development will happen first in post fertilization later only embryo development will happen so in ncrt they have given a sentence that endosperm development precedes embryo development what do you mean by that statement means endosperm development will happen first embryo development will happen next why so now after listening to my classes if you study you will have a better understanding in the same manner when once the endosperm is developed this endosperm will be used as a nutritive tissue for the developing embryo to ensure nutrition embryo development will happen next endosperm development will happen first now we concluded that endosperm cells are filled with nutritive tissue right now there are different types of endosperm formation but the common type of endosperm formation is free nuclear endosperm formation free nuclear divisions we have seen with female gametophyte embryo sac formation two nuclei four nuclei eight nuclei there we stopped because the embryo sac is seven cell eight nucleated but here don't stop you keep on going so what happens the primary endospermic nucleus which is triploid keeps on doing free nuclear divisions and how many nuclear divisions free nuclear divisions will do it depends upon the plant to plant it is variable n number of free nuclear divisions it will do it will make these many nuclei and after that subsequently it will go for cellularization some nuclei will be covered with the cell walls so the free nuclear divisions results in formation of liquid endosperm and the cellular subsequent cellular divisions helps in formation of solid endosperm let us take an example of coconut in coconut in tender coconut the water what we consume is an example for free nuclear liquid endosperm and then as the tender coconut gets matured the water content liquid endosperm decreases and the white kernel the solid endosperm decreases means the kernel is an example for cellular endosperm the liquid is an example for free nuclear endosperm understood children now this is about the first one under post fertilization endosperm development ploid of endosperm is triploid now this endosperm we are telling it acts as a nutritive tissue for the embryo development now we have two types of embryos in dicot seed we have dicot embryo in monocot seed we have monocot embryo you know dicot seeds will completely consume the endosperm during its development so that's why dicot seeds are non endospermic why dicot seeds are non endospermic because the embryo has completely consumed the endosperm that's why the dicot seeds are non endospermic whereas monocot seeds they will not completely consume the endosperm they will retain bulk amount of endosperm they will eat only little endosperm bulk amount of endosperm will be retained so that's why monocot seeds are endospermic dicot seeds are non endospermic this is related to the first step under post fertilization which is endosperm development now coming to the board the second one is embryo development now we are going to talk about dicot embryo development and monocot embryo development i divided the board into two parts now the first part this is dicot embryo development and this is monocot embryo development okay now in dicot embryo development we'll start with zygote this is zygote m represents the micropylar end c represents the calazal end now after fertilization when zygote is formed the zygote undergoes a transverse division it has undergone a transverse division it is an unequal division makes a bigger cell which is called as basal cell which is also called suspensor cell makes a smaller cell which is called terminal cell it makes a embryo so it is called as embryo cell and if this is a basal cell then this is called as an epical cell epical cell is towards a calazal end and a basal cell is towards a micropylar end now this basal cell will undergo repeated divisions and horizontal divisions transverse divisions it will make and it will make 6 to 8 suspensor cells so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 6 to 8 suspensor cells the last suspensor cell will swell up and it is called as hostorial 
cell and all the 6 to 8 suspensor cell including the hostorial cell will develop from the basal cell so that's why basal cell is also called suspensor cell now what happens to this terminal cell the terminal cell will undergo one longitudinal division and one transverse division and it makes a quadrate embryo tetrad embryo it will make okay now so zygote then comes two cell embryo then comes quadrate embryo then what happens so this hostoria and suspensor cell will remain the same these four cells will become eight cells then the quadrate embryo becomes octant embryo it becomes octant embryo in the next division what happens these eight cells will become 16 cells and one more thing is happening out of these suspensor cells the suspensor cell which is towards the embryo is growing and it is called as hypophysis it is called as hypophysis so this suspensor cell grows and becomes hypophysis cell now this is called as proembryo now after proembryo it undergoes these suspensor cells are not undergoing any division only this part undergoes divisions and it makes a globular embryo you can see this is a globular embryo in which the hypophysal cells will divide and they are going to make the root parts like root cap, root tip, root cortex they will make and these cells will divide and they will make the dermatogen these cells will divide and they will make the ground tissue system cortex and this part will make the cotyledons dicot embryo will have two cotyledons so the bottom part will make the cotyledons and the pumule above that will make the ground tissue above that will make the dermatogen epidermis above that will make the root part and these are the degenerating synergy cells this stage is called as globular embryo after the globular embryo what happens is this hostorial cell creates pressure on the globe and because of that pressure what happens the globe splits into two parts and this is the next stage this is called heart shaped embryo it is called heart shaped embryo heart shaped embryo is a characteristic feature of monocot embryo it is a characteristic feature of sorry dicot embryo so in dicot embryo and monocot embryo till the globular embryo the stages are common afterwards only they will take different steps now what is the different step we see in dicot embryo development we see from globular embryo because of this hostorial pressure the globe is splitting now into two parts now which appears like a heart chordate shape so it is called as heart shaped embryo or chordate embryo now this is one cotyledon it's a future cotyledon this is the other cotyledon in between the cotyledons this part is called as pimule pimule will make the shoot system in between the two cotyledons it is pimule and we know the upper parts will make root cap root tip and root cortex and these are the degenerating suspensors then next what happens means these cotyledons starts growing the cotyledon starts growing and actually pimule will make the shoot system radical will make the root system radical is geotrophic pimule is phototrophic so radical should come down and pimule should go up so then the next stage is a mature dicot embryo in mature dicot embryo the cotyledons are curling like this so these two are the cotyledons and this is a pimule and here is radical this is radical so this is mature dicot embryo development they will ask you the stages they will ask you to arrange them in order first is a zygote after the two cell stage after two cell stage we get quadrate embryo then we get octant embryo then we get pro embryo pro embryo to globular embryo globular embryo to heart shaped embryo and mature dicot embryo i think we understood about dicot embryo development now let's move on to monocot embryo development in monocot embryo again we'll start with the zygote micropylar end and colossal end one transverse division will make a basal cell and terminal cell here the basal cell is making suspensors but here what happens the basal cell will make only hostorial cell the terminal cell will divide again to make two cells middle cell and top cell the terminal cell is dividing to make middle cell and top cell the top cell will make the cotyledons and the middle cell will make the remaining parts of the embryo like embryo radical epicotyl 
pimule, suspensors, everything. One, two, three, four, five. All this is made from the middle cell only. The top cell will make the cotyledon and the basal cell will not divide. Basal cell will make only the hostoria. Then zygote two celled embryo then this is three celled embryo from there we are getting a globular embryo in the globular embryo the hostoria is here the middle cell has to make embryo has to make radical has to make pimule from these regions and this part is going to convert into cotyledon so it is converting into glob shaped embryo after that it develops into such a type of structure where the hostoria will be here and the suspensor cells these are the suspensor cells and this is an embryo this is the embryo which is here I'll show this is the embryo which is formed from this portion and this is the single cotyledon which is formed from this globular embryo now this part if you see this is the shoot tip shoot tip is covered by coleoptile this is a root tip root tip is covered by coleoriza monocot will have only one functional cotyledon hood shaped cotyledon right what is that called scutellum the single functional cotyledon of monocot is called scutellum it has developed from the top cell from this globular part whereas the middle part middle cell is making the embryo and the basal cell is making the hostoria this in NCRT they have given us like this this is a matured monocot embryo in matured monocot embryo this I told cotyledon is towards one side and what is this called single functional cotyledon it is called as a scutellum the single functional cotyledon of monocot is called a scutellum and what is this small tiny structure it is the second degenerated cotyledon of the monocot what is it's a degenerated cotyledon vestigial it is called as epiblast it is epiblast and this is the embryo in the embryo this represents the shoot tip shoot tip is covered by coleoptile right and this is the root tip and the root tip is covered by coleo Rhiza. It is covered by Coleoriza. So we finished endosperm development and we finished embryo development also. Now we are going to talk about ovary developing to fruit and ovule developing into seed. Take a screenshot. We will continue. Right. So now let us talk about ovule developing into seed. The matured ovule will develop into seed. There are two types of seeds, right? Dicot seed and monocot seed. Yeah. Now when we have to talk about seed. So we need to talk about dicot seed and monocot seed. Now, what is seed? Seed is the end product of sexual reproduction. Seed is a final product of sexual reproduction, right? Now, the dicot seeds have two cotyledons on either sides. And at the center, it has embryonic axis. Now, this is a embryonic axis. Now, the portion of the embryonic axis which is attached to the cotyledons is this portion. It is called as tigellum the portion of the embryonic axis which is attached to the cotyledons is called as tigellum the portion of the embryonic axis which is below the cotyledons is this portion it is hypocotyle hypocotyle will develop into radical and radical will make the root system and if we have if we are looking on the top this portion of the embryonic axis is above the cotyledon the portion of the uh, embryonic axis which is above the cotyledon is this portion it is called epi above epicotyle epicotyle will develop into pimule and pimule will develop into shoot system 
now a dicot seed it has such a type of structure and we told the dicot seeds will completely consume the endosperm there's no endosperm here so that means the dicot seeds are non endospermic so we can use an other word which is called ex albuminous because endosperm contains protein rich layer that means albumin is a protein no protein so ex albuminous it is also called non albuminous also dicot seeds are non albuminous in most of the cases dicot seeds are non albuminous ex albuminous but castor is an exception what is an exception is castor the exception is castor now when we have to talk about monocot embryo in monocot embryo if we have to draw we'll draw the maize embryo which is given in ncert textbook this is a monocot seed we told monocot seeds will retain bulk of the endosperm they have retained bulky endosperm so they are endospermic so monocot seeds are endospermic endospermic means we can write albuminous right so we can write albuminous and we can write uh, ex albuminous or yeah albuminous we can write and non endospermic we can write now in that what is this this is fruit wall which is called pericar and the pericar fuses with the seed pericar means fruit wall the fruit wall fuses with the seed coat okay and this is a endosperm which is covered by a layer this layer is called aileron layer the inside part is called endosperm this is endosperm and the endosperm is covered by a protein rich layer this came in the neat examination endosperm is covered by a protein rich layer what is that name of the protein rich layer it is called aileron layer it is called aileron layer and this is a monocot embryo it has only one cotyledon yeah this is a hood shaped cotyledon scutellum of the monocot and here is an embryo this is an embryo and this is root tip the root tip is covered by colio rhiza and this is a, a leaf primordium shoot tip and the shoot tip is covered by another tissue called coleoptile so this is monocot seed this is maize seed what they have given in ncert and this is groundnut seed or pea seed we can take right now monocot seeds are endospermic but the exception a monocot which is non endospermic is orchid the exception of monocot without endosperm is orchid seed so children this is about endosperm now when the embryo is developing what happens to the ovule ovule is developing into seed now inside the ovule the body is there the body has new cells what happens to the new cells actually the new cells will be consumed off but in some plants the new cells will be retained the remnants of that new cells which is retained is called as perisperm this has also been asked in neat examinations what is perisperm the left out new cells is called as perisperm the remnant the remnant of endosperm is called as perisperm where do we find it we find it in black pepper and beet sugar beet we find perisperm in black pepper and we find it in beet okay take a screenshot we'll continue right so this is about seed so we discussed about endosperm we discussed about embryo we discussed about seed now coming to the fruit now ripened ovary becomes fruit right so the fourth event is fruit formation so what happens the ovary after fertilization the ovary after fertilization develops into fruit it develops into fruit and the ovary wall will become fruit wall 
the ovary wall will become fruit wall children the fruit wall is called as pericarp the fruit wall is called as pericarp and if the pericarp if it is differentiated into outer epicarp middle mesocarp and inner endocarp if you are able to differentiate into all these three layers call that fruit as fleshy fruit call the fruit as fleshy fruit examples of fleshy fruit are mango orange all these are examples of fleshy fruit where we can differentiate epicarp mesocarp and endocarp now if the pericarp is undifferentiated then that is called dry fruit if the fruit wall which we are calling it as pericarp if the pericarp is undifferentiated if it is not able to differentiate into epicarp mesocarp and endocarp call it as a dry fruit in ncrt for examples of dry fruit they have given mustard right in ncrt for dry fruit they have given mustard and groundnut as example right now the fruit which is formed without fertilization is called parthenocarpic fruit so fruit formed without fertilization the fruit formed without fertilization what is it called parthenocarpic fruit it is parthenocarpic fruit examples for parthenocarpic fruit seedless uh, banana seedless grapes all these are the examples like banana is a popular example these are the examples of parthenocarpic fruit so parthenocarpic can also be induced by subjecting it to growth hormones so parthenocarpy can be induced parthenocarpy can be induced by subjecting the plant to plant growth hormones all right now parthenocarpic fruits why do we like because they are seedless fruits we can simply take the fruit we need not remove the seed now actually what is true fruit and what is false fruit what is true fruit and what is false fruit now the fruit which is formed after fertilization in true fruit the fruit should be formed after fertilization and the edible part should be ovary the edible part of the fruit if it is coming from ovary then that is true fruit now what is false fruit false fruit is also formed after fertilization only but the edible part is not the ovary false fruit is also formed after fertilization only fertilization occurs here but we tell the edible part is not ovary the edible part is not ovary examples for false fruit we can take cashew nut we can take apple we can take strawberry so strawberry is an example apple is an example in both the cases what we are eating is the swollen thalamus the swollen succulent thalamus we are eating here so since we are eating thalamus not the ovary so strawberry uh, cashew nut all these are examples for false fruits children this is the information for fruit and fruit formation is also a mechanism of seed dispersal only now fruit will be eaten by the bird and the bird carries the fruit to a new place it eats there and it throws the seed there so it can establish at a new place now take a screenshot this is the information about the fruit take a screenshot then we will discuss about the advantages of the seed right since we are telling seed is an end product of sexual reproduction now seed offers several advantages now if seed is there is not there then there is no agriculture now if we have to list down the applications of seed if we have to list down the applications of seed the first application is seed is the basis for agriculture 
without seed we cannot assume agriculture seed is end product of sexual reproduction show so it shows genetic combinations it shows new combinations new variations which are required since seed is the end product of sexual reproduction since it is the end product of sexual reproduction it shows variations it shows genetic recombinations this is an other advantage now seeds they can be stored in dehydrated state so it means they can uh, uh, they can retain dormancy they can retain dehydration so we can tell seeds can tolerate dormancy and dehydration next step example seeds can retain dehydration and dormancy so during unfavorable conditions they are somehow surviving now seed uh, can go to new places and it can establish and it is preventing competition it can newly establish a new habitats so seed has better adaptive strategies to establish a new habitats seeds have better adaptive strategies to establish in new habitats so in the same habitat if it is there under the same tree if all the seeds will fall off there will be competition these are the advantages of the seeds coming to seed viability how long the seed can be viable according to the recent records if you see there are two seeds which are having highest viability records now one is called lupinus arcticus lupinus arcticus is excavated from arctic tundra from a plant called lupine it has germinated after completing 10,000 years of dormancy this point came in the neat examination so lupinus arcticus excavated from which place arctic tundra now it has completed 10,000 years of dormancy and then it germinated now the recent record is from the king harold's palace near the dead sea they've excavated one more archaeological people they've excavated one more what is it called phoenix dectilifera date palm so that seed germinated after completing 2,000 years of dormancy means the viability is 2,000 for date palm the viability is 10,000 for lupine right so the last topic of the chapter is apomixis and polyembryony now sexual reproduction is called as amphimixis because male and female gametes are fused it is called amphimixis a sexual reproduction is a type of sorry apomixis is a type of asexual reproduction which mimics sexual reproduction by producing seeds and the term apomixis was introduced by winkler winkler introduced the term apomixis what is apomixis it is a type of asexual reproduction it is a type of asexual reproduction but it imitates but it mimics sexual reproduction by producing seeds by producing seeds there's several ways to uh, make apomixis for example if you take a dicot egg has been formed without reduction division that dicot egg can directly develop into embryo then that is a method of apomixis only okay now what is the advantage of apomixis now hybrid seed production is an expensive thing and for a country like india uh, for a farmer in a developing country buying hybrid seeds is an expensive task but hybrid seeds are giving good yield but that hybrid seeds he will sow he'll get the fruit in that fruit also seed will be there that seed if he use he'll not get the same yield because seed as a product of sexual reproduction sexual reproduction happened so variations will come so again and again the farmer has to buy the hybrid seeds if he has to get the higher yield now scientists are working out to make the hybrid seeds apomictic so that there will not be any segregation then the seeds without a, a, a sex, sexual reproduction they will continue and they will retain the characters that is an advantage of apomixis what is the advantage of apomixis they are trying to convert the hybrid seeds 
into apomictic seeds. If we convert the hybrid seeds into apomictic seeds, then no variations will be there. If there are no variations, then the farmer can use the same seeds again. He need not buy it. Coming to the next concept, the last concept, polyembryony. The concept of polyembryony was discovered by Anton von Leeuwenhoek. He observed polyembryony in citrus and mango. Now, zygote develops into embryo, that is one embryo. One seed will have only one embryo. Sometimes, the nucella cells, which are outside the embryo sac, they also develop into embryos. Then, one seed will have many embryos. Open an orange seed, open a citrus seed. If you open that seed, remove the seed coat, you can find one, two, three, four, five, six. These many bits are there. Means, these many embryos are there. How come these many embryos? in one seed because from zygote one embryo came and the other embryos came from the new cellular cells that is polyembryony so we find it in citrus and mango epomixis is seen in some members of astraceae not all the members of astraceae in some members of astraceae and in grasses it is found what is the advantage of epomixis farmer need not buy the hybrid seeds again and again what is the advantage of polyembryony so many embryos will be there so many plantlets can be developed many plantlets can be developed children may finish this chapter so if you like the content like share and subscribe to my channel in the next class we'll come out with a new chapter thank you